My name is Sky Adrian. Um, I use he, him, or his pronouns, or you can just call me Sky. Um, I identify as a gay cis man. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people think that automatically because you're homeless, um, you don't have any dreams, any aspirations, you don't want to go anywhere with your life, um, you're not smart. Uh, most times people do think it's your fault while you're homeless. My homelessness was a bit layered because like not only were I like homeless, but then I was also like an immigrant. So therefore I couldn't get certain benefits that my other um, homeless counterparts were able to get. So I couldn't get social security benefits. I couldn't get SNAP, which are like food stamps. Um, I couldn't get a form of income, so I couldn't get a job because like I didn't have a social security to do that. So, you know, my, my experience is like, it was pretty intense. Like that's like the best word that I could use to like describe um, my experience. Had my parents been supportive in the capacity that they needed to be, like my process would have moved a lot smoother. Like I wouldn't have to go through all the strings that I went through. I wouldn't have to wait these long two years before I finally got a social security. I finally got work authorization. Like all those things could have been sorted had they been supportive in the way that they needed to be, but they weren't. So I had to basically do everything on my own. What I will say though, is that I've always been like independent, like, you know, regardless of them helping or not, like I wasn't gonna sit down and like sleep on the subway or I wasn't gonna sit down and not have a job. Like I wanna go to like Zara or go to H&M and see something I want and just get it cause I can't like, you know, and I knew what it took to get that. So I started to like, like seek the relevant like resources that I needed that were like at my disposal to be able to like help me get through that. I think the most important moment happened on the 21st of July, and that's when I moved out. I moved out of a shelter, moved into my own apartment, pushing my own key. I think that was like the most important aspect of anything that I've done. Because like for the last two years, I've lived in a shelter where it's like, it closes at eight and like it reopens at 8 p.m. So basically, you were away from your belongings, away from like, you know, somewhere safe, for 12 hours out of the day, regardless of whether or not you had a job. So, you know, that was like difficult. And then also like you had all these stipulations that you had to do to reside in that kind of housing. I mean, it was pretty cause I was in a very affluent area and like I was in a very affluent apartment, very bougie, pretty and stuff like that, but I didn't have access to it. So it really wasn't my apartment. So I think the best accomplishment was me getting my own key where I can leave when I want to leave. I can go in when I want to leave. I can see a chore and don't have to do it. Like I can just, you know, like that was my independence. So there's one where my partner doesn't live here. My partner lives in Canada. So like that's like a huge struggle because there's so many times where I'm going through certain things and I want to like speak to him like physically, like, and like I can't. So that's like a struggle sometimes, like having to deal with that. And even though he tries as much to be present, like it's still a struggle. Tapping into that community to get the strength that I had to come out of a shelter. Cause I feel like what happens when you go into a shelter a lot is that you get complacent. You know, like there's all these services that are available to you and you don't realize that the older you get is the, is the less these services become available to you. And people don't know that until it's like too late. My personality, like I'm really friendly, like I'm really like outgoing. Um, I have like this aura, like I attract all kind of people, whether or not it's solicited, but like, yeah, I do. And like, I feel like it's my great strength because I use that to my advantage, like to be able to like network and speak to people and like create rapport and like relationships and so on. So I think that's like my greatest strength right now. There's like a few persons that I can call in. Like I, like my partner is definitely one of them. Like, although he's not physically there, like he's always been there. Like, you know, like, and, and like, even though um, he can't help me in certain capacities that I'd like him to. Like, he's still physically there. My grandmother, who doesn't live here, she also helps me. Like, she keeps me grounded. Because, like, we've had these conversations before when I was younger. And I used to look at this lady like, you're dumb. You're crazy. Like, this is not the world. And now I realize the world that she was telling me about is what I'm living in now. And, like, I can always go back to her. And she's, even though we've had our issues about my sexuality and who I am, she's she's gone beyond that and it's more so about my safety and my well-being and I appreciate that she's accepted me to that point and there's no one else I mean aside from my partner that knows me the way that my grandparents do and I think that's why they're my heroes um, I definitely believe in like restorative justice because I feel like and for 
for those who don't know what restorative justice is, um, it's basically not only exploiting the stories of like marginalized communities, but uplifting them and empowering those individuals. And I feel like a lot of times what happens with homelessness is that people use my story and exploit my stories for their good looks. And I feel like the reason why I do like the co-chairing of this New York City Continuum Bo Care Board that I do and doing like the senior youth organizing at FIERCE is because like I feel like I need to put a lot more people with lived experiences in marginalized communities like LGBT youth, people of color in leadership positions because I feel like you need to shift that kind of narrative where it's always like people of color and LGBT youth that are disadvantaged that are speaking about their stories but that's where it stops. Like, you need to not only speak about your story, but be in leadership, giving your insight to how you can make change happen. And I feel like that's why I'm solely doing what I'm doing, like moving people of color outside of exploitation and into empowerment. Youth are gonna be like, you know, those individuals who are gonna be framing the narrative for the society in the future. And they use media more than anything else. As simple as Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, all these different platforms the media is like entrenched in and I feel like that's the best way to outreach to like youth and that's why I'm always like excited to get onto media to speak about it because the media is just like a link that you can send and you'd be surprised to know how much reach that link can have and I feel like that alone is every reason why you'd want to like use media to speak to people. And there's a lot of services that's available in the city like and that's why this city is like if you go to the South, like I just went to Ohio, and all the LGBT youth that I met, they all want to come to New York. Just because there's so many different services that are available to you, regardless of your HIV status, regardless of your immigration status, regardless of your, like, you know, your, your, your health status, your mental health status, like there's so many different resources that are available to you. But what's not communicated is that there's all these restrictions that if you don't know they exist, can become such a problem. Like ageism is such a huge problem to access to services in the city. The older you become, like literally, when you turn 21, like you're no longer a youth, you're an adult. So what's gonna happen is like, if you're in a shelter at 20 and you turn 21, they're kicking you out the next day and you have to go to like a like an adult shelter. And there's no LGBT services within DHS shelter. So like, basically, like regardless of whether you're ready for it or not, like you're an adult at that moment. And that's just one problem. You know what I'm saying? Like, transportation is a huge other issue. Like, unless it is that they're giving you a metro card, like, you have to jump the turnstile or beg to get, to get where you're going. Like, and these are all those kind of issues that you face, like, within this city that, like, you know, like, even though the resources are available, like, it's a problem. It's, like, how accessible these resources are. And so sometimes it's, it's almost contradictive. Like, okay, we have all these great resources, but how accessible are they? And that's like, like that's always the issue, like when you're talking about the city. The significant like issue that you'll always hear from anybody who talks about this is funding. Like money is always a problem. So this year, fortunately for the city and the state, we were able to amend the Runaway Homeless Youth Act from 21 years to 24. So youth up to the age of 25 years can access a youth serving shelter now, which is great. But then the funding to allocate for that space and to get more beds for those youth, like, it's not there. And it's not funded yet. And DYCD, like, they, um, they have accepted that amendment, but they still have not told us when the funding is going to come in to allocate for that. So therefore, you're telling me that at 21 right now, like, I have to wait until you decide whether or not you're going to fund the money while I am in an adult shelter on SAFE or maybe in a warehouse somewhere, like, you know, or on the street or on the subway, until you decide that you want to find somewhere for me to sleep. While you sit there being indecisive about what you want to do, there's so many lives. Up to now, 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. And obviously, they're at a lot more risk than their heterosexual counterparts that are homeless. Because at the end of the day, like, there's so many trans-identified individuals who are on the streets selling their bodies for somewhere to sleep. There's so many survival means of living that's happening. Like, literally, before I got to AFC, I was staying by a friend, and he wanted to sexually exploit me for me to stay there. And I'm not going to do that. But there's many other persons who don't have the capacity that I have that are doing that to get somewhere to sleep, to get food, to get shelter. 
Like, that's not okay. And the fact that you turn 21 and that's immediately what your life is going to look like, like, no, that's crazy. I feel like you just, like, you know, regardless of all these services that are available to you, like, you have to depend on yourself. Because... There's no one else that can advocate for yourself more than you can. There's no one that knows you more than yourself. And that's every reason why you need to be able to advocate and stand up for yourself because you know your needs more than anybody else does. And you need to tell people that this is what you want and this is what you need to get. A lot of my first year here was like, oh, I don't know, I'm shy and this and whatever. I had to break out of that. Like I had to come out of that and say, this is what I want and this is where I want to be. And like I had to start letting people know that this is what you're here for. You're here for me to get to here. And if you don't get to here, then you're accountable for my demise. You know what I'm saying? And it's that kind of like assertiveness and that kind of like, you know, like independence that I took on that helped me to get to where I need to be at. Also, like knowing what you want is like almost like the best thing. I could have went to AFC's like transitional independent living program where I'm paying rent and I have some leverage of access to the space. I don't want that. I want to push my own key. So you know what, I knew what I wanted and I started working and, and going to the spaces that could provide me with that need for me to get what I want. And then also like if I felt like someone was not performing or someone was not giving me the services that I need to, then I'd complain about it. And I'd say, this is what I'm supposed to get, this is what I deserve. And that's why I'm in the position where I am now because a lot of people can't do that or don't, won't do that because they have so many other issues to worry about. So I'm standing in solidarity, like representing them to ensure that they're also getting the services that I demanded that I got. Coming here was like on TV, it's the American, like it's the American dream. Like you're seeing the white picket fence, you're seeing like two story house, like it's, 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 it looks different. And then when you come here, you're living the American reality. What's not shown on TV, what people don't tell you. So when people like see me on like Instagram, Facebook, and they see like this great life, I was telling them that my life didn't always look like that. It's just that I did not see the relevance of me sharing the struggle that I was facing when I got here. Because I want people to see that regardless of those struggles, you can still be amazing, you still can be beautiful, you still can be handsome. And that's basically what I have to say for that. Thank you.